Hey there everyone, I just wanted to do a quick video um, to mark the 5th anniversary today, uh, March 11th, of the Great East Japan Earthquake. Um, I guess it's kind of a triple disaster. It's known first of, well, first of all for being one of the most, I think the most powerful earthquake ever recorded in Japan. Uh, it was out at sea, but even on land it actually broke the Japanese shake scale to a number I've never even heard of before actually being realized. Um, and it was very big here in Tokyo as well. Then of course there was the, um, from what I understand to be probably the worst part of the disaster for, for in terms of loss of life, there was the um, enormous tsunami that in most parts of the coast was between 7 and 10 meters, you multiply that by 3 for feet, so between 21 30 feet, uh, the highest points along some parts of the coast, it was over 35 meters, it was over 100, what, 105 uh, feet tall. Um, and you know, just washed some towns clear and then of course there was the um, resulting nuclear accident at uh, the uh, Daiichi nuclear power plant in Fukushima um, which was interesting I still it, in spite of all of the revelations that uh, they knew it had melted down and they didn't say and all this sort of stuff about what was going on there I still think of the third disaster very much as a psychological um, event uh, which I know is a little bit strange, but I think that left in many ways the most profound... Um, it kind of messed up the whole response to the first two. Um, and it left me... And I think it, I have to admit it, I mean I spent months arguing uh, that that's not the main thing, you know, this is the... Um, uh, the, the main thing here is that there's been this terrible earthquake and there's been all this uh, loss of life and everyone's you know, over focusing on the, the nuclear accident and they're focusing on it because they're afraid to go and report the real story of the earthquake and the, the tsunami which is what was first traumatizing me but in the course of saying that's the real disaster that frustration and that debate in itself probably ended up having perhaps the longest lasting effect uh, on, a, on, on a lot of people um, and I think it was I'm not blaming the media but it was, it was kind of a media hype you know enhanced or uh, uh, driven phenomenon um, so yeah I, I guess that's for a quick reflection thing so uh, a lot of people are probably looking back at this time um, in terms of what happened, I've, I've got it, by the way, I actually recorded like about, through, I think maybe two weeks after the event, I recorded like my first ever hour long video where I was actually going through everything at the time, the events, as they unfolded, as I remembered at that time. And I think I told the whole story in a lot of detail and I actually went, explained a lot of stuff. It's actually still a very good video. I watched it back recently and I think I covered it um, all off pretty well, but um, I can maybe share a little bit more than I could back then. But just again, to, um, to recap, uh, how I experienced it. Uh, so, I also wanted to talk down the impact on Tokyo a lot back then. I, I, I'm more comfortable now because the thing is, Tokyo didn't suffer. I, uh, as you all know, Tokyo, we got a huge shake here, but we got probably the biggest shake that you could get without it being a real disaster. It was like a real serious drill. Um, so, what happened in Tokyo? We had uh, a quake, which I think I described this before. Um, you always know, you can kind of tell when a quake is a, 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 a small quake in terms of like a small bomb going off underground, a low magnitude quake or a high magnitude quake, like a big bomb going off, even if it's far away. Um, even if the shake's not very big, a really big earthquake. And I felt, I remember when the Niigata earthquake happened, we could feel it in Tokyo. It wasn't very strong here, but it felt like it starts out like a normal quake sort of, and then all of a sudden it changes gear or, you know, you can feel kind of a dawn like it changes phases um, and that's the, that's, a, that's to me the telltale sign of a really big quake happening and I've felt that pattern and then I looked up the news and I found out it was a uh, Shindo 5 plus you know a destructive quake uh, where it occurred in Tokyo it was a Shindo 2 or 3 it was a tremor but you could feel you could just tell by the duration of the quake and by the way the quake behaved so you know with Tokyo I still vividly remember experiencing the first uh, then the main quake, which was that you know it's a very big tremor, um, which I had assumed, oh, this must be like a big local tremor. Um, 
but then it shifted gears <laughs> and then it shifted gears again and I was expecting given how big it was um, how much the building was shaking how much stuff was sort of swaying and for stuff was falling over which I'd never experienced before in my life the biggest quake I'd ever felt and I assume that must be very a, a very big quake maybe very close to Tokyo the 1923 quake that destroyed Tokyo is based in Yokohama um, and this could have been that sort of distance from Tokyo I thought so you know I did what everyone was doing 2011 got online and uh, I misread the kanji I'm embarrassed to admit in my rush to read where it was uh, I saw the the, uh, the 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 news flashes coming up. This quake was centered on Miyagi. I misread it as Miyazaki. Now, Miyagi is about 600 kilometers away. So to feel a quake that big, that centered that far away, is ridiculous. Miyazaki is like a thousand kilometers away from Tokyo, and to me it was just incomprehensible. And it said immediately, it's a Shindo Seven. It is the 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 to It is the exploded upper end of the scale frankly I've never heard anything more than an upper six before seven is like the catch-all um, too big to be measured sort of quake um, so I misread it first I remember I, I tweeted holy holy shit that that huge quake was in Miyazaki and, and I remember Michaela uh, immediately tweeted back at me are you sure I think that's a different kanji I looked at this oh crap it's the same Mia on the front but it wasn't Zaki it was Miyagi but then I thought wait a minute but that's almost as crazy as this quake being in uh, Tokyo. Uh, sorry, being in Miyazaki, just in terms of it's still incredibly far away and it was incredibly strong. Um, it was uh, the being on the twentieth, twenty ninth floor of the building that I was in. Uh, it was a I was working in a law firm at that time, and it was like being in a boat. You know, it was huge sways. It was actually they talked about this. It caused some. It, they never really planned for a scenario of what you'd call a low frequency like a like you know a high frequency is like this and low frequency is like this like big like bass kind of waveforms uh, you know like like sound waveforms the earthquake waveform when it hit Tokyo they're very very big waves and what it actually caused was it was like rocking on a big rocking chair and it caused these huge buildings to sway like boats you know in ways that when they predict earthquakes they think of a, a rattle like that but these were actually like that and that actually caused this kind of um uh, resonance with these buildings it caused them to sway like crazy and you're watching the buildings out the window even after the quake is finished and you know the buildings are just swaying a long way around although it's a testament to how aware of the need for earthquake safety construction is around Tokyo um, and the construction quality of these buildings that within Tokyo for the for a quake of that size there were a couple of old buildings and a couple of uh, there were a couple of collapses and some loss of life in Tokyo uh, in poorly designed buildings but compared to what you would expect like statistically for a city that size it was pretty remarkable how well it went I mean you know how, how, how little damage was actually inflicted um, but uh, yeah yeah I actually uh, so I ran out of the office I had uh, 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 my, my Zacti cam in my bag and in the middle of the quake I actually did pull it out and I took a sh I started to I wanted to take a shot of the room or something but I realized I was shooting inside the office that I was working in and I didn't really get a very good shot and I kind of thought what am I doing and I, I, I shot like 20 seconds and I put it down again I didn't really get anything good I've still got the video of it but I'll, I'm, I'm not going to show that I'll, I've never shown that before and it doesn't really really capture anything I know that some people who were in public places I, I think Atomic Boy X in particular was like in an elevator uh, plus his dramatic <laughs> panicking dialogue along with it uh, went completely viral of course and that um, and I was, I, I, I had that instinct that, oh, take a video, but, but no, it wasn't the time or place, and I quickly changed my mind on that. But for me, it was really, really the event of the, um, the internet where um, I've written a blog about these thoughts, and I'm going to probably put the link down below rather than tell the entire story. I've told it before, but basically, it was kind of, um, it was like hearing a nuclear bomb had gone off nearby. I mean, it, it was biblical, the, just the size alone, before we even knew about the tsunami, before the nuclear accident, the size of the quake itself, a magnitude 9.2, which was so big, they, they, I think the original reading was like a magnitude 8.5, because it just maxed out all the instruments, it was it overwhelmed them. A Shindo 7, like 300 kilometers away from the, from the epicenter out in the ocean, I, it was a real biblical like movie disaster movie st scale size quake it was incredible and it was hard to take in and you kind of you get this weird sense of uh 
uh, it's excitement. I've got to be honest. It's excitement. You get adrenaline. I mean, your, bo your body reacts to emergency situations by providing you with adrenaline to give you this energy if you need to run away or, or whatever. And um, you have this, and it's kind of like, um, yeah, it, 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 it's weird, you know, and, and you get pumped. Well, I was I was kind of pumped and, and with this kind of nervous energy as I'm trying to call up my wife, my son who's with my mother-in-law at home to check that they're okay, the phone lines are not working, the phone lines are all overwhelmed because everyone's gone to the phones at the same time. Um, internet was the only thing that was working, all the phones were down. Um, and then like immediately all of these helicopters went into the air and I think it was like uh, maybe half an hour after that there were, there were some big aftershocks, there was some damage inside the office where I was where um, I wouldn't go under the desk, a lot of people went under the desk and put their helmets on like they're supposed to and one person went under the desk and had a whole bunch of shelves, like heavy shelves collapse onto the desk above them um, and get dinged by a few of the books and so on I mean nothing, nothing that serious but enough to sort of freak people out um, but it was when they started showing, I think we were watching via the internet, the first waves of the tsunamis coming in. And I think they predicted originally like 3 meter tsunamis and then maybe 7 meter tsunamis. But I think they corrected to 7 meters when they saw them. 7 meters being 21 feet, being 3 stories basically. A, a, a story of a building is about 3 meters. So you're talking 2.5, 3 stories. And when these things came in, they turned out they weren't just 7. They, they, they kept coming in and coming in and they got to be 10 meters. 15 meters, you know, in some places. And again, you, when you had the Indian Ocean tsunami, you were watching the all this kind of tourist video came out afterwards. But this we were actually watching live. As you, with every earthquake, even with little, little teeny tiny tsunamis that come in, you can see the the, the crest waves um, of these tsunamis as they come in. They always show it live on NHK. But the fact that we were watching. Um, these waves like just wash over inland and swallowing up cars and buildings and you can see all this debris floating around and you're watching it from a great height but you're realizing that these are picking up cars that are driving with people in them and there's a lot of debris there but you're just thinking I could you couldn't make out people but it was a bit like 9-11 I think when people started to realize that that wasn't just debris that was falling from those buildings, that there are people there, you know, and it kind of you start to connect with what you're watching. Um, even looking at it from a distance, um, you start to, it sinks in for a moment. Holy crap, those are all people down there. Uh, and that's when it's, oh, you know, even, even, even just thinking about it now, you feel very hopeless and uh, it's very, very sad and, you know, and you, get, you, you can't help but feel emotional thinking about it. Just thinking that those people just didn't know what had them. They never had a chance, and, and how helpless it is in a way. I mean, in a way, we share the tragedy. I mean, we experienced it ourselves by being able to watch it live. But at the same time, we're also completely helpless. And I actually experienced this um, about three weeks previous, because about three weeks before this, there was the earthquake in Christchurch, uh, which is where my father is from, and my my grandmother and my uncle both lost their houses in that quake. And that was a similar thing. It was covered live on the internet. And there was a time there with complete chaos, and I, you know, the, they knew that the center of the city was destroyed. I had no idea. I couldn't get through to my family or anything like that. And you sp I spent hours um, just wondering if they had even survived, and no way to figure out. But with all of this, it's funny you could see the destruction, but you're completely hopeless to know what's going on. In the old days, you'd get the news reports afterwards with a bit more information. So it was really the f maybe it was the first. Maybe, no, 9/11 was probably the first sort of live mega disaster, but it was uh, in terms of a natural disaster. And remember, this is a much, you know, infinitely bigger scale. Well, those were two buildings. This was like 9-11 spread across, you know, an area the size, half the size of California. Um, so, uh, you know, you're in the office and you, I'm trying to get in touch with my family. I'm trying to think, how do I get home? I've uh, heard we start to hear that all the trains have stopped um, for safety checks. Some areas are getting power blackout. Some parts of, you can see smoke on the horizon from the oil refineries around Tokyo that uh, one of them caught fire. And I, I know, again, I see that, and I think, was well, this like Kobe, where that whole city caught on fire after the uh, earthquake there, and they couldn't put the fires out? It was the fires that killed everybody in, in, in Kobe. So but again, when I'm seeing out the window, appreciating that this is hitting them first, I'm worried about Tokyo. I'm worried that, you know, are there going to be huge fires from this? Is there going to be chaos? Um, I eventually got through to my wife, and she was working in an area close to Tokyo Bay so they wouldn't let her out of the building because of the tsunami warnings they, they they told everybody to get up onto the upper floors and to stay there until they got the all clear which they realized might take all night uh, fortunately my son was sick and 
he was at home with my mother-in-law he wasn't at daycare um, so I think I waited about two hours before I actually went out to walk home I had to walk down 30 flights of stairs um, and I went out again it was like a kind of a, a movie scene going out just with this mess of thousands of people leaving the building it was like society stopped you know you hear about these kind of you know the, the, the these end of the world movies that you that you get these disaster movies where all the cars are stopped and people just walking through the roads and you know over everybody kind of you know walking out it was exactly like that I, I, I again I also shot a video and recorded which uh, of being in that situation and you could also see the adrenaline um, still kind of popping behind I, I couldn't help it it was you know it's just a natural reaction to that but um, yeah it was just completely surreal it was like being in one of those I mean you literally were in a disaster movie and, and all the while knowing that you know look Tokyo is in good shape and they're not and no matter how bad it is in Tokyo it's much worse than other places but I, I'll say now as well but Tokyo I was pretty scared being in Tokyo as well I was worried uh, mainly for the family, mainly going home, making sure everyone was okay. Uh, I, I walked home, uh, my, my sister-in-law couldn't get home, and uh, so she was actually working near our house at that time. She came to stay, so I, st I spent the night at home with my son, my mother-in-law, my sister-in-law, and my wife stayed had to sleep at work. A lot of people had to sleep in their, their offices actually, or they got stuck between offices and going home. Um, where they slept in train stations overnight, things like that. Uh, and a lot of people just gave up and decided to walk. And they walked, like, if you've got a one-hour commute, that's about a 12-hour walk. And a lot of people walk 12, 14, 15 hours home. And a lot of people really messed up their legs doing that. They, a lot of people got injured doing that. Um, so that was, like, day one. And, I, the, you know, and then the second, the, the, that was the first and the second disasters, I suppose. You know, and I really experienced, own, well, I, I guess I experienced the first one. I experienced the quake, but not the tsunami, although I kind of uh, indirectly experienced the tsunami as well. Everybody who could see the internet in those days could. Um, the next day, I remember, I still remember the, vividly the sequence that we found out about the nuclear accident. NHK put on a news flash at about 10 a.m. And they said, uh, news flash, uh, TEPCO's gonna be holding a news conference at midday, um, but it's, in, it's with regards to uh, this picture that you can see from the Fukushima Daiichi facility here you can see uh, this shot taken at uh, 10 a.m. 8 a.m. yesterday where you can see all four reactor buildings prominently there uh, whereas the the photo from uh, this morning uh, one of the buildings is missing there are three there are only three reactors there now it was like one that disappeared um, they didn't show the actual sh the, the the video which later came out of that building exploding uh, and with the hydrogen explosion, it was just a remote photo which just was taken probably on a time, you know, thing and it just, they just noticed one of the nuclear reactors is apparently vaporized and gone missing. And when I saw that, I turned to my wife and I said, well, I get the feeling this is going to be more serious than we thought it was. So how about I rush up to the supermarket now and get water, uh, get some supplies. My wife said, don't be irresponsible. You know, don't, if everybody rushes out, rushes the supermarkets, just panicking at this without knowing all the facts, you know, society's going to come to an end. Wait for the news announcement and decide. And I, I, I did. Um, we, we waited till the 12 uh, o'clock announcement where they, the government announced that, yes, there had been an accident at uh, the nuclear power plant. They're trying to figure out what's going on. But, you know, dude, one of the power, one of the reactors is missing. <laughs> you know, you know the, these things don't fall off the backs of trucks. So I kind of turned around and said, okay, uh, they confirmed it, it's gone. Uh, can I go to the supermarket now? My wife looked at me and she said, yeah. <laughs> so I went outside. As I left the building, there were some uh, foreigners living in the building. I remember I was overtaken as I left the entrance with these by these uh, very brightly, uh, you know, all of this kind of uh, bright north face, sort of all weather gear and backpacks, and very tall. I, uh, they, so they looked stereotypical Dutch or Germans. Um, full body gear, full backpacks, running out of the building. And, you know, I saw them go to the end of my street, you know, left was towards the supermarket and right was to the main road and to the airport. And they were all turning right. <laughs> I turned left and went to the supermarket. And the supermarket, by the time I got there, all the water was gone. And I actually, uh, as I can say now, I, call, I called up Victor. I said, hey dude, could you please pop up to the nearest uh, supermarket and uh, just get a box, you know, six two liter bottles of water and uh, could you just go and get one of those and uh, quietly post it to me just so that we have it and uh, without hesitation, I mean, he's a good mate, you know, that's uh, 
say no more. Don't, done. You know, yeah, uh, even though I think he was still asking, so what's going on there? I'm like, I don't know, but you know, um, yeah, the supermarkets are emptying out here. I didn't, I, I didn't want to broadcast that. There was a, uh, some people sort of overhyped that. Oh, look, you know, on the Saturday, how all the supermarkets and convenience stores were going bare in Tokyo. They were here and there. It wasn't everywhere, but there was a rush on the supermarkets immediately after that announcement. And yeah, I couldn't find water, so uh, Victor was very good. He got that for me. They sold out pretty soon in Nagoya as well. And then we spent a very long time dealing with trying to figure out. You know, we had to make a call ourselves. Um, my wife had had an obligation to be at work, um, which she couldn't abandon. You know, she couldn't abandon. We, we we didn't take the decision to stop working lightly. Uh, so we had this thing on Monday, you know, do we, uh, what do we do? Do we evacuate temporarily? Do we stay? Most foreigners evacuated, even temporarily, some even to West Japan. Anyone with family in West Japan moved their family over there, and a lot of foreigners just moved their, their Japanese families overseas. Um, we thought about that, but again, my wife insisted because of her, the nature of her work as well, um, was busy as a result of this accident. Um, so. I kind of told her, okay, if people at your work start disappearing, we're going to go. But uh, we kind of thought we would play it more by year. But when I got back to work on the next Monday, my work was about half Japanese lawyers and half American lawyers. By about midday, midway through that week, there was only one other guy um, there with family still in Tokyo. Everyone else had gotten their families out. And frankly, a lot of, just about all the expats had disappeared, even just temporarily. They came back, but they were taking their families overseas. I was talking with this other guy, I was like, well, why didn't you move anyone out? And he said, well, all my family's in Tokyo, I've got nowhere outside of Tokyo to go. And frankly, that was the situation with my in-laws as well. They were all exactly the same, Tokyo people. So, you know, the choice for me was my wife quits her job and leaves the country, or, um, yeah, uh, you maybe go and stay in a hotel in Osaka, which some people did, but no, that, that wasn't something that we thought we wanted to do. So, you know, we kind of stayed and were watching, and it was, uh, then the, 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 the panic started, uh, I played rugby for a French rugby team. The French were went into the biggest panic, which I found, you know, kind of cynically ironic, given how they are the most nuclearized country in the world in terms of power stations. You know, if you feel that uncomfortable with nuclear power, um, I dealt with some very, very unpleasant, very hysterical people who wanted to save my life by encouraging me violently to leave. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, and, and the stress of that, the stress of the worried family, the stress of uh, people who couldn't understand the, the information that was all coming out in Japanese. And the information was coming out in English 24 hours late, and it had been through a copy edit room where it, had, it was being spun and sensationalized to play. This could be the worst disaster. This could be everyone in Tokyo is about to die. And it's easy to make, it's easy to play up the story like that, I think, when you're remote from it. Um, I don't think that the press would have res would have reported about it so irresponsibly if they if the disaster had taken place in London or New York they would be thinking about quality information and, and, and keeping everyone calm but when it happens in a more exotic location like Tokyo or you know if it happened in Delhi or Libya or something like that um, you know they they want the, the, the they want the Michael Bay version, and that's what was coming out of most news outlets, including news outlets that I have a lot of respect for, or I had a lot of respect for, like BBC, um, which I found kind of very disappointing and very frustrating. Um, and, you know, they were flying people over who, and again, you know, I was kind of like, well, they were flying people over who were reporting about the nuclear accident from Osaka and from West Japan because they were afraid to go to Tokyo. I was in Tokyo. <laughs> Yeah, and Tokyo was fine. It was actually, you know, less radiation in Tokyo, far less radiation in Tokyo than actually on the airplanes flying outside out, out of Japan. Um, but these people were afraid to go up into Tohoku to actually cover the actual earthquake and the tsunami because they were afraid that everything up there was sort of contaminated. And everyone was believing the worst case scenarios that were being sought out and published through the media. And that being broadcast was causing panics within the expat community within Japan, which caused rumors to actually come out of the, the expat community, which startled the Japanese community, which then the government was realizing, no, 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 you, got, you know, we need to figure out how to disperse English information as well, because it's, it's causing false rumors. But um, uh, yeah, it, was, it, it turned into a real, the best way I can describe it, I think it's still the way I described it at the time was when you hear about like a civil, like Syria, like the civil war or in Libya, and they say, well, 
the civil the civil war there's a lot of fighting happening in these cities but the people in this city um, they can hear on the horizon can, you know shell fire and gunfire but it hasn't actually come to the city so everyone is very nervously waiting to see if it will come and that's kind of how it felt it felt like being I mean I, I never really appreciated uh, what that must be like before but we weren't in a war zone Tokyo wasn't being you know evacuated it wasn't being irradiated per se or you know it, it had a few <laughs> had a few moments but um, but it was like everyone was waiting there waiting waiting to find out you know is the war going to come here uh, you know are, are our lives going to be in danger or not and some people weren't willing to take the risk and we're running out early just like people who maybe leave a war zone early and some people were sitting tight and I can kind of understand you think you watch TV well why would you stay in a city you know which you were like all these cities in Syria that have been destroyed why would you sit there and wait for the war to come but it's not an easy decision to up uproot you know and you have to make that based on good information um, and that's what there was a there was a real shortage of there were the, the information was you know people were poking fun at the Japanese uh, information for being so kind of you know stay calm and carry on but at the same time the Japanese who were covering and providing information had a much bigger stake in the quality of the information than, than the the the, the um, parachuted in, you know, foreign correspondents that couldn't understand what was going on domestically. They couldn't understand the first sources of information. And I found that very frustrating. It was through that that I really discovered the utility of Twitter and all these other people on Twitter who were doing what I was doing, which was taking these first sources of information and making them available in English, is, is converting that into English and making it available as soon as possible to try to help people who were struggling with that or were getting crappy or out of date or incorrect information from others. Um, it is interesting, however, that of course a lot of the speculation, and it was speculation, hysterical speculation, did later prove to be true, of course, including of, about the meltdowns, and there was a long debate, uh, is it really a meltdown or not? Um, and yeah, it was a meltdown, but there again, what does a meltdown mean? We, you would have assumed once you hear the word meltdown that, okay, Tokyo's finished, China syndrome, all this sort of stuff, you know, and we know that all four of them melted down, but, you know, the degree of contamination, the air of contamination, isn't what Chernobyl is, although a lot of people play up that it is bigger than Chernobyl or whatever. Um, you know, I mean, Three Mile Island was right near New York, probably similar distance. In fact, I think it was even closer to New York than, than um, Fukushima Daiichi is to Tokyo. But, um, you know, the movies play up the idea of meltdowns being the end of the world, and that's what I was prepared for. And if the, if the media had said meltdown, I maybe would have actually skipped the country. Um, but I didn't. They didn't announce it. I didn't skip, even though that information was incorrect, even though people were speculating about it. I stayed. And, um, I mean, Tokyo, for, for lots of reasons, um, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the hysterical predictions about, you know, the impact on people on Tokyo, in the end of the day, the biggest impact, the biggest cause of death from the nuclear accident was not from radiation, it was from stress. It was from the stress of relocation, it was from the stress of needing to leave their houses, it was from, you know, um, a lot of suicides, a lot of people dying alone, a lot of, there was a lot of disruption to lives, but, um, you know, and there was a lot of media which, which acted in a way which, which, you know, sought to ramp up that, you know, to make it more exciting, to make it more like a movie. Uh, which changed my perception on, on all this sort of thing a lot, but uh, you know we're still dealing with the with the fallout of that today. Um, and what I, in terms of the way that I experienced it, one thinking of that as a drill for what the real big thing in Tokyo is going to be when we have power cuts, when you have the train stopping, when you have a huge earthquake, when you have to have all these plans for how you're going to get home. Um, and and the fact that that's a near certainty. We've had these regular quakes. Uh, half the distance between Miyagi and Tokyo the, the, that have been happening on the same spot over and over in North Ibaraki which implies that you know this moving down that the the, the, the tension that wa that got released up north has now been shifted further south along the fault line it almost seems to me uh, just a, a, a an obvious uh, an obvious certainty that we're going to experience the same quake probably happening closer to Tokyo next time and maybe even directly across from Tokyo or in Tokyo Tokyo is on these fault lines so it was a good mental preparation for what that's going to be like. It took a lot of the imagination and guesswork out of what a quake is going to be like. And uh, the upside of that is, is I, I think Tokyo is, you know, going to be a lot better prepared for it when it happens. Although it's going to be super tough when it does happen. Um, it changed my perception of the media. It changed me a lot. It really, you know, I, a lot of people really do reveal their 
characters in that sort of circumstance of high stress and high panic and you know I saw I, I, a lot of people that I still uh, follow and I respect a lot on, uh, particularly on, through Twitter um, I became aware of them through this event and the way that they behaved and there's a lot of people that I completely lost a lot of respect for <laughs> through this whole thing as well and a lot of organizations that I really lost respect for I lost a lot of faith in the in Western media uh, and the way that news is put together um, maybe I haven't maybe I've, I've recovered some of that now I'm not as deep I was deeply cynical for a long time after that uh, although even now I, I, I don't I don't find a single source of news to really be completely trustworthy anymore actually about reporting anything um, which is a shame you know I, I, there's a huge market for, for reliable news objective news and you know there are sources that I thought were were still that although they were becoming a, a, a declining market but, um, yeah yeah it really changed my perception of people and the world and the way that I look at things you know it reminded me I think that you know things are don't get attached to things you know things are transient you know you think that um, so if, if, if you survive the, the tsunamis which everybody saw you know where those houses in their entirety in, in an instant were completely washed away um, it's not sad that you lost your house. You know, it's it, it's a joy that you survived. I mean, for as tough as it is to even then survive a situation like that, you know, life is it, right? You know, you don't rush into the house to go and get your favorite, you know, video game or something like that. Um, you get all your family and your loved ones out and, you know, and, and just be prepared in life to know that um, we like to think that we're in control. But, you know, you know, we're not we're not we live in a world that you know mother nature absolutely has the upper hand and we live on mother you know we live on mother nature's terms and not, nothing you you're not reminded of that anywhere more than in japan i think that and i think that plays into the psyche uh in a positive way of the japanese people i think that people here really do respect um the impermanence of things and uh the kind of place in the world maybe more i think i think maybe uh westerners are a little bit arrogant in the way that we look at the world uh, and that gets shown up, you know, when, when we have disasters as we have in New Zealand and so on. Um, so yeah, you know, um, a lot of friends became b better friends, a lot of people, I developed huge respect for so many people and I discovered this community of people, maybe like myself, um, you know, like-minded people who, who kind of look at world, the world the same way. I, I, I discovered, I became very savvy on how to discover and, and filter and use information. Um, for me, Twitter is like, I know Twitter's in decline at the moment, but you know, Twitter just proved to me to be the best thing ever as a result of this. Um, it really changed my perspective on life. I'm sure it left me slightly traumatized as it still is. Um, changed my outlook a lot, but at the same time, I think it's, uh, it's a good thing in the end of the day to be thoughtful and, and humble and uh you know self-aware of, of where you are as, as this did and, you know um and as i constantly said throughout the crisis at the time i'm only coming to it now because i i i, I, I talked about this all the time when it, when it was actually happening the disaster you know it, it was an incredible incredible earthquake and loss of life uh you know just as, as an event it, it's without parallel to anything that you can think of actually that I, that I can think of um, in the 20th century for all the horror that happened in the 20th century you know for, for instant events instantaneous events um, so you know it's a day to even even if you didn't directly lose anyone that you know there I mean you know it is a day to, to, to reflect on uh, I mean when 25,000 people die that is or you know disappear those people all have families and friends and connections i mean that, that that affects you know millions of people directly you know and indirectly it affects you know billions um so it's it, it, it's a it's a very you know it's a sad day for a lot of people as it will continue to be for a long time um but i think it's also a good day just to reflect and to remember you know um in the end of the day you know what you build up around you is not what you build up around you is you know it, it's the it's the person that you are and and the person that you are is uh the person that you are when you're most tested you know when you're under the, these sort of situations and you you have to think what am i going to do when this happens anything could happen at any time and you know 
Um, in a way, I feel kind of lucky to have been able to uh, experience this in a, in a relatively safe way uh, once myself, but also to know that it's going to happen again. Uh, and just remember what's really important, you know, um, it's people, it's always people, you know, it's uh, stuff doesn't matter. It doesn't, it's nice, but it, it doesn't matter. If stuff can be replaced, people can't. So just, you know, uh, I, I, I value it as a day to remember the importance of the, the, the people around me that I respect and that I love and, uh, and how important those people are and, and how beyond all of our control these things can change suddenly. And uh, to think about, you know, what are you going to do when this, when, when this sort of thing comes to you? So, um, yeah, a lot to ponder, a lot to remember. It's a very, very sad day. My, my, my thoughts and condolences go out to every, everyone who actually directly suffered loss uh, in that tragedy and the many other tragedies like it that, that have happened. Um, and, you know, be prepared. Be prepared and uh, just just uh, spend a bit. It's worth spending a moment just to think about... Uh, just what this should remind us of, you know, and what's really important. That's that's what I'm going to take from this day, and uh, I hope that's what you guys do too. So stay cool, and uh, see you again on Tokyo tonight on the weekend. Okay, peace. <laughs>